be attentive to the prayer of your people. Make us be people who carry your vision in our hearts for the sake of the world. God of heaven, by your mighty hand, build your church, strengthen your people, bring your kingdom to transform tomorrow and eternity. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Hills. And I know some of you watch online. It's not morning anymore where you are around the world. But whether you're online or in person at North Richmond Hills, West Fort Worth, or South Lake, I'm thankful you are with us. And if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know we have rolled out a new vision for our church for the next five years. Ask for nations and generations. And I have two big thank yous to give right away. One, I want to thank all of you that are joining us in this season of 40 Days of Prayer using your prayer guides. It is a blessing to me each morning when I get up my guide and I realize that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people around the world. They're joining me in this prayer time for our church. And I thank you for that participation. I also want to thank you for the, your participation in our survey the last two weeks. One of our goals is to become more ethnically diverse. It's hard to know where you're going if you don't know where you are. So we're just trying to assess where we are regarding ethnic diversity. We've gotten about 2,200 responses. We're still tabulating, and we hope we will share that with you very shortly. So what we're doing in this series called Build a Future is we're using the book of Nehemiah as a platform to understand how we can step into the future God is calling us to pursue. So we've seen that uh, we build a future through prayer and, and through faith and through unity. What I'm going to share today is not as glitzy or as flashy as some of those virtues, but I think it might be the most important. And so, as I said last week, every legitimately good sermon refers to the Dallas Cowboys at least one time. So we're going to start there today with one of my all-time favorite cowboys. His name was Emmett Smith. He grew up in Pensacola, Florida, and as a young boy, he had a vision. He wanted to rush for more yards than anyone who ever played in the NFL, and he did. When he retired, he had rushed for 18,355 yards. Now, some of us are old enough to remember watching him play for the Cowboys, and here's what we remember. He was not the fastest runner who ever played NFL football, nor was he the strongest, nor was he the shiftiest. But maybe he was the most resilient. His average yard per carry for his career was 4.2 yards. You do the math. You rush for over 18,000 yards, four yards at a time. Not counting all the times you caught passes and got tackled or all the times you sacrificed your body to block for your teammates. That is a whole lot of getting knocked down and getting back up. Now, our church vision has us pursuing some awesome and audacious goals in the next five years. And it's going to take faith and prayer and unity, but it is going to take amazing perseverance as well. Because any time a person or a church steps up for God, the enemy steps in. Satan wants people, Satan wants churches to believe that ruins and rubble are their permanent address and they can't do anything about it. So you can expect his assaults any time you try to build a better future. And here's the thing about the devil. He doesn't care if you never become an atheist, if he can tempt you to become a quitter. Nehemiah knew about that. He felt a tremendous pressure to quit. And he knew well the challenge of staying in and just putting one more brick on top of another. So we're, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit today to encourage us by looking at his story and how his story can inspire us to relentless 
perseverance. So we're in chapter four now. Remember, the first step of leadership is to assess reality. In chapter two, he looked at the whole situation, got a good feel for the problem. The next step of leadership is to cast a vision of a desired future that's so compelling, people will sacrifice to pursue it. And the people have started building the wall. But now we get to chapter four. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put it into the work. And then the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. And therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we are aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. And from that day on, half my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. And those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. And then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. And we're widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Now we need this lesson today, and here's why. Vision leaks. I don't care how big, how bold, how audacious, how exciting the vision is, vision leaks. Now, you've heard the phrase, you'll never finish what you don't ever start. That is so true. Here's another truth. It's always easier to start than to finish. Okay, you remember that diet you started? The first day went real well, didn't it? Remember that exercise plan? The first week went well, didn't it? Remember, you were going to read the Bible through in one year? The first month went pretty well, didn't it? You'll never finish what you don't start, but it's always easier to start than to finish. All right, let me put it this way. Vision is easier to launch than to achieve. Probably nobody in ministry understands this principle more than people who plant churches. So last weekend, I was with Carlos and Gina Isaziga in San Diego, and they've launched Luminous City Church. And nine months after they launched the pandemic hits, and they've got to shut down. And now they're basically having to relaunch and rebuild their church. And it is great work, but it is hard work. It is exhausting work. The launch was so fun. But vision is easier to launch than to achieve. So part of our vision is to plant 15 more churches in the next five years. Let me show you the next three we're planting. This is Gabe and Carrie Garcia, New City Church in Oakland, California. They are launching their church today. How cool is that? The next picture. This is Joshua and Erica Simonette. And they have launched Hope Baltimore Church just Two weeks ago. Full disclosure, Joshua was in the NFL and played for the team in Washington. Now, we vet all our church planners. He has since come to Christ and repented of all of his idolatry. And then also this fall, Terrence and Emma Mullins are planting History Maker Church in Miami. And here's what they're all going to tell you. It is hard to launch a church, but it's so much harder to grow a church after you've launched it. Because it's often after the launch that the enemy steps in and the eagerness slows down. 
Oh, Nehemiah didn't have trouble getting people excited about the vision. Let's go rebuild the wall. But the wall got halfway up. And the people got tired. And the enemy showed up. And there was so much rubble. And the vision began to leak. Let me tell you why vision leaks. Here's number one. New wears off. It just does. That first brick feels so light, but halfway up that wall, those bricks just get heavier and heavier because new wears off. Now, you know this in life. Remember that new car? And if it's sprinkled on your car on the way home, you got the towel out and you wiped it off because that car was clean. It was new. Six months later, you got McDonald's wrappers and old french fries in the floorboard of that car. You could throw a seed in the back seat. Something would grow. Because new wears off. Hey, I'll get a little bit edgier. Remember you brought that first baby home? And that first night at 2 in the morning, that baby cried, and you jumped up, and you oohed, and you awed. And six months later at 2 in the morning, that baby cried, and you're thinking, when is this kid going to sleep through the night? Now, I'm just being real. I am not going to lie in the house of God. You know I just spoke the truth. <laughs> or, you remember when you became a new Christian? God was so real and worship was so awesome and the people at church were so amazing. And then you find out later, people at church are sinners just like you. And sometimes God doesn't feel close. New wears off. The longer you do anything, the harder it is to stay excited about it. It was Awesome's launching Celebrate Recovery. It's staying excited months and years later that's going to be the challenge. The first baptisms, the first church plants, the first rooted groups, the first foster families, the first asylum-seeking family we advocate for. It's all going to be awesome at first. But here's what I've learned. The kingdom works that actually last the longest are rarely the works you were able to do the fastest. Vision leaks. New wears off. I'll tell you something else about vision. Critics wear you out. Critics can be stunningly resilient. Remember we read about Sanballat and Tobiah? Did that sound familiar? It should. They showed up in chapter 2. They show up in chapter 4. They're going to show up again in chapter 6. Critics are amazingly persistent. They attacked Nehemiah's plan as feasible. They said, if a fox walks on your wall, it'll fall over. They attacked Nehemiah's character. This is what critics always do. If they don't like the message, they attack the character of the messenger. And they attack the plan as doable. Sometimes the critics won't quit until you do. David knows about that. He said in one of the Psalms, malicious witnesses testify against me. They accuse me of crimes I know nothing about. They repay me evil for good. I am sick with despair. Critics wear you out. See, the enemy doesn't bother people he doesn't think are a threat. I've been at this church for 32 years. I cannot recall a single year this church didn't get criticized. One of the things I admire most about the elders and the leaders of this church all those years is they haven't let criticism get them off mission. Criticism should never surprise us, but we cannot let it derail us. And then finally, I'll tell you why vision leaks. New wears off, critics wear you out, and good people wear down. I don't care how noble your heart is. I don't care how pure the mission is. People get tired. Ministry is messy. There's always rubble. It's awesome launch and celebrate recovery, but when you really do start ministering to people dealing with addictions, you find out it's messy. Helping foster families is messy. Advocating for asylum seekers is messy. And we set ourselves up for great disappointment if you think anything worthy is going to be easy. 
Remember Elijah, probably the greatest prophet of the Old Testament who led the greatest revival in the Old Testament, calls down fire from heaven, eradicates the Baal prophets in the whole nation. The next day, he gets an email from Jezebel, I'm about to kill you. He runs out to the desert and says, I quit. Just take my life, God. I'm done. Here's the reality. Nobody is immune to weariness, no matter how God-honoring the mission. We're trying to do some awesome things in the next five years in our church. We're going to get tired. And that leads to one of the most significant things about the book of Nehemiah. There are no miracles in it. Read it for yourself. Not one single miracle. Nehemiah believed in miracles. He reminded God and he reminded the people of God's mighty miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in a supernatural God who did and still does supernatural things. But Nehemiah didn't build a future on the miraculous. He built a future on the monotonous. He just kept putting one brick on top of the other. And here's what I've learned about vision. It takes the path of most persistence. I know it's not the most glamorous of the virtues. I know it's not the one that gets the most praise and attention. But it is the persistent that accomplishes the things that last. I want to show you a picture. This is a drawing of one of the greatest preachers and revivalists of all time. His name was John Wesley. I want to read to you from his diary, one month in his diary. Sunday morning, May the 5th, preached in St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday night, May 5th, preached in St. John's, deacon said, get out and stay out. Next week, Sunday morning, May 12th, preached in St. Jude's, can't go back there either. Next Sunday, May 19th, preached in St. Somebody Else's, deacons called special meeting and said I couldn't return. That night, May 19th, preached on the street, kicked off street. Next Sunday, May 26th, preached in Meadow, chased out of Meadow as bull was turned loose during service. <laughs> Next Sunday morning, June 2nd, preached out of the edge of town, kicked off the highway. That night, June 2nd, afternoon, preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came out to hear me. God doesn't give visions to be launched. He gives visions to be reached. The goal isn't fast. The goal is last. And so, we're chasing some awesome things as a church. Nations and generations will be impacted, but it will not be easy. We must persevere. How do you make vision last? Remember these three things. First, keep the focus on God. Nehemiah kept reminding the people they weren't building a great wall. They were building a wall for a great God. Verse 14, he said, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Verse 20, he says, our God will fight for us. See, discouragement and weariness are typically the result of a temporary loss of perspective. And here's what happened. You got tired, you got worn out, and you gave the attribute of awesomeness to something besides God. Suddenly, your problem became awesome. Your enemy became awesome. And here's the thing. You can have a huge problem you can have a huge God. You can't have both. So you've got to decide when you're tired and worn out, I got to call something or somebody awesome. Who's it going to be? Keep the focus on God. People that persevere, remember they have the ultimate teammate. So I'm going to read a verse, one of my favorite verses from one of my favorite chapters, Romans 8. If God is for us, no one can defeat us. He did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all. So with Jesus, God will surely give us all things. Four of the best words you will ever hear. 
God is for us. I want everybody, every campus online to say that out loud. Ready? One, two, three. God is for us. Every word matters. God, the Almighty, the Sovereign Lord, the King of Kings, the Good Father. God is, not was, not maybe, not trying to make up his mind, but right now, God is for. He's not neutral. He's not waiting for you to get it together so he can decide if he likes you. God is for us. Not some of us. Not the best of us. All of us. Everybody, one, two, three. God is for us. So when we ask for nations and generations, remember who we're asking. Let's go back to John Wesley, and the man beside him is a drawing of William Wilberforce. Wilberforce had a vision to abolish slavery in Great Britain. And every attempt he made at Parliament was defeated. He was about to quit. Wesley asked him to come see him. Now, Wesley's on his deathbed. Six days before he dies. So feeble he can barely speak, so he asked to write. And here's what he wrote. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you'll be worn out by men and by devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? All of them. Are they stronger than God? Wilberforce stayed at it for 40 years five more years and three days before he died he saw parliament abolish slavery in great britain this is not our vision this is god's vision and you don't ever have to wonder if god is about to quit and so keep the focus on god here's the second thing we do when we get tired we make the future about others one of the most important responsibilities of leadership is to help people remember the why. And so Nehemiah says, fight for your families. Fight for your sons and for your daughters. Fight for your wives and for your homes. Resilient people have a bigger agenda than it's just about me. I've told you before, my mother and father had a rough few years when they got married to the point that they separated and I lived a year of my life without my father. And my mother and father sought counsel and I'm so thankful for the counsel they sought and got. Christian and non-Christian alike said to my parents, think about your boys. What's best for your boys? I wonder today if that's what people would tell them. I wonder today if they'd hear, you know, you got to do you. You got to be the best version of you. But my mother and father, for the sake of their sons, came back together. And I watched them build an amazing marriage that lasted 52 years. Because they made the future about others. And so, don't be discouraged by rubble when you're doing the right thing. We knew when we got into the business of following Jesus, it was going to get messy. He's got a cross on his back. What did we think? It was going to be easy? But I want you to remember something. Your labor today is going to be somebody's blessing tomorrow. Do you understand so many of the things that we're pursuing this vision, we're not going to see right away. That foster child, it's going to be many years until they're a grown woman or man living a better life. That asylum family, what's it going to mean generations from now? Because they got a good start by Christ followers. The people in recovery, the people going through our reader groups, the, the, the leaders that we're raising up that are going to be the elders 20 and 30 years from now. The school in Africa that's just a few hundred now is going to be a few thousand in 50 years. 
Some of us are going to be gone before the greatest fruit of this vision is even harvested. But I want you to remember, we're enjoying today what somebody else had the vision to build. Somebody else sacrificed and somebody else paid the price so that we can enjoy what we have today. So let's keep reminding each other that it's not going to be till we get to heaven that we understand all God accomplished through us because we stayed in the game. Make the future about others. And one more thing. When you get tired, and you will, let's sustain the builders with encouragement. See, Nehemiah knew loneliness increases the feeling of weariness. And so he took concrete steps to increase the feeling we're in this together. He said, we're spread out on this wall. We're separated from each other. So I got a dude and he's got a trumpet. And he's good at it. And when you get attacked, he's going to play the trumpet. And everybody's going to run to that trumpet because nobody is going to get attacked and have to deal with it by themselves. We're going to sustain each other. You see, fellowship is a great remedy for discouragement. The book of Hebrews are written to tired people. They were Jews that had started following the way of Jesus, and they got pressure, and they got oppression, and many of them started to quit. And there's a lot of great stuff in that book about what you do when you're thinking about quitting, but one of the simplest and most practical things he says is this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, he didn't say encourage people to attend church. He said attend church to encourage people. Who are you going to encourage before you go to your car today? What weary person are you going to pour into today before you get in your car and go home. Because it's so much easier to stay the course when you're not the only one on the path. About 10 years ago, exactly, I ran my one and only marathon. That's a picture of me, and I look pretty good, don't I? That's because the race hadn't started. And I've seen pictures of marathons, and I've seen all those people on the side of the road with their signs, and I always wonder, what's the point of that? And now I know. Because I don't care how much you train, nothing prepares you for the actual race when you get so tired and your mind starts to play games, and you've had all these reasons why you could just quit. And it's amazing how much help you get from the people who are cheering. I still remember some of the signs I saw. You all look like Kenyans to me. Toenails are overrated. <laughs> Chuck Norris never ran a marathon. And my personal favorite little cute three or four-year-old girl, keep running or I'm going to give you a wedgie. <laughs> you see, one of the greatest needs of our church vision is an army of relentless encouragers. Those people that are praying for and standing by the folks trying to leave their addiction are going to get tired. The people that foster and the people that do respite work for foster kids are going to get tired. The people that advocate for asylum seekers, the people that lead our rooted groups, the 2,000 a year that are going to work for kids, they need to be constantly encouraged. In fact, little side note, to all of you that have children, in our children's ministry at every campus. There shouldn't be a week go by that the people that are blessing your kids don't get blessed by you. You see, if we are going to stay on course, we're going to have to stay connected. So you've all seen this sight up in the sky. A flock of geese flying over. These amazing animals can fly tremendously long distances. And people have studied why. 
I mean, obviously that, that V formation helps them with wind turbulence. But you know what they've discovered? Now, I don't speak geese, so I'm trusting the experts. They're, you know why they're honking? They're encouraging the leader. By their honking, they're somehow sending the message to the head goose, keep flying, we're behind you. I'm saying now to every person listening to me on every campus, you are now commissioned to be an army of holy honkers. <laughs> That's part of your ministry, and you need to pursue it with great diligence. Because if we'll stay focused on God and concerned about others and connected to each other, we will stay on course. And God will use us to build a better future brick by brick. Now, if I have seemed passionate this morning, it's because I am. I've been walking with Jesus now for over 50 years. When you're young and walking with Jesus, you get maybe more inspired by charisma, giftedness. But when you've been Jesus a long time, you start to see the value of resilience. That the people I respect the most today are the people that had a good reason to quit and they didn't. We all have that person. Almost everybody listening to me right now is knowing the Lord today because somebody in your life didn't quit. I'll show you mine. This is a picture of my grandparents. This picture was taken just after we adopted our first son, Michael. Jim and Ona Ashley. They were poor people. Their house wasn't bigger than your garage. And my grandmother was the only Christian on either side of my family. She went to church every Sunday with her husband never beside her dragging two boys who didn't want to go. And she was there every week. Her Bible was by her chair every day, and she read it even though nobody ever asked her what the Word of God said. My grandmother was poor. She was unknown. And she was stubborn. And I'm so glad she was. Before she died, she saw her husband come to faith. She saw my father return to the Lord. She saw her grandson become a preacher. I'm saying to you, when you get tired and it feels like no one's noticing, keep reaching for the next brick because my grandma would tell you when you get to heaven you have no idea how many people you reached so God we pray in Jesus name that you would give us the strength the encouragement the foresight, the comfort we need to keep showing up at the wall and building the church that Jesus wants. We pray in his name. Amen.